very much. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And um, yes, yeah, so, so this is a work in progress. And um, any sort of any advice or any information from the audience is uh, much appreciated in terms of the specifics of Presbyterian culture, especially in the 1820s and 1830s, um, would be very much appreciated. Um, so I suppose to begin, I suppose why are we talking about John Mitchell um, is that he's probably most famous for his famous uh, um, description of the famine saying the Almighty indeed sent a potato blight, but the English created the famine. That's one thing he's uh, notorious for, um, probably. And the second is his support for the Confederacy and slavery during the Civil War. Um, so this very modern 20th century view of Mitchell was not that but, um, in which he was held in um, the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century in particular um, by nationalists. And so you have O. McNeill, for example, um, republished Mitchell's articles under the title an Ulster Man for Ireland, being letters to the Protestant farmers, labourers and artisans of the north of Ireland in 1917, in a bid, um, wrong-headed perhaps, uh, to try to, to get Presbyterian support in particular for the, for the emergent um, uh, nationalist movement and republican movement at that time. Um, likewise, Sinn Féin founder and um, tireless publicist for Irish separation and Irish separatism, Arthur Griffith, the founder of Sinn Féin, he described um, Mitchell as um, in all of Ireland's public life no character stronger or, pu or purer can be found and Griffith um, a lot of his work and a lot of his publications um, were taken up with republishing the work of the Young Ireland Movement and um, Mitchell amongst them in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries um, but the highest praise arguably for Mitchell came from Patrick Pearce and um, he claimed that the jail journal which we will look at in greater depth later in this paper um, was the last of the four Gospels of the New Testament of Irish nationality, the last and the fier fieriest and the most sublime. So there's a clear religious echo here in the way in which Pierce is describing Mitchell's own writing, which in some ways is an homage or um, a reference to, Pierce, to Mitchell's own writing style. And Pierce equated Mitchell um, with one of the, being the, the four masterminds um, of, the, of, the Irish, of Irish nationality, and um, the others being Ruth Tone, uh, Thomas Davis, James Fenton Lawler, and he explicitly makes the connection between the evangelists of the Gospels, um, saying that Will Tone's autobiography is the first gospel of Irish nationality, and Mitchell's jail journal is the last, creating a direct um, comparison with St. John's Gospel, which in some ways is the most theolo uh, theologically sophisticated um, of, the, of the four gospels. So I think that Pierce has taken this from Mitchell in a way which is heavily influenced by Mitchell's own religious rhetoric and the way in which Mitchell himself described Irish, Irish, Irish nationalism. And we'll see this, this religious rhetoric, um, which, which Pearson inherited from Mitchell, um, was rooted in P Mitchell's own transcendental um, view of, of politics in particular, but particularly in the role of the nation and how the nation take, becomes almost like a godlike figure um, in, the, in, in Mitchell's own view of politics. Um, so by doing this, we'll provide a clearer picture of the force and meaning um, of the apparently religious nature of Irish nationalism, I think. So I mean, there's a, a lot of um, especially critical uh, accounts of Irish nationalism, such as Conan Cruz O'Brien's idea of the sacral nationalism, can in some ways um, be, be traced to the rhetoric employed by John Mitchell. Um, but let's look firstly at, the, at Mitchell's own life. So just a, a brief overview of who Mitchell was and where he was born into. So he was born into a liberal Presbyterian family in Ulster in 1815. And he moved around a little bit um, from, he was in uh, Dungiven, Derry and before settling in Newry. And um, so around this time you have a grown, grown sectarianism arguably in Ulster um, after the Act of Union in the 1820s and 1830s. And you, and you see an increased identification of a common interest between the um, Presbyterian um, and the established churches around this time in the 1820s, which manifests itself in debates around the um, non-subscription to the Westminster Confession and this religious political alliance, especially in Ulster, about the, um, between, um, between Presbyterians and Anglicans um, more and more. And so Mitchell's father had a very key role to play in these debates throughout the 1820s. And by 1830, um, John Mitchell Sr. 
had in fact left the Ulster Synod and, and established with others the Remonstrant Synod. Um, and this was rooted in um, theological differences. And Mitchell Sr., although he did not describe himself as a Unitarian, has been described since. And the, the, Unit the Unitarian Church in Newry sees Mitchell, John Mitchell Sr., as being a major, um, a major forebear. So I think it's important to have a sort of closer look in terms of this milieu um, in which um, John Mitchell, in fact, um, was raised. So it has earlier biographers of Mitchell um, have said that he was, in fact, took part in the debates in the Ulster Synod in 1828, as his father scribes. So he would have been the, um, the age of uh, 13 or 14 around that time. And this year is crucially important, I think, because Mitchell's father actually produces a um, he publishes a series of his sermons, um, apparently at the request of his um, congregation in Newry. And so and it was entitled The Scripture Doctrine of the Divinity of Our Lord Jesus Christ in, 18, in 1828. So it was divided into a series of sermons purportedly dealing with purely scriptural problems, but it served as a rallying point for Presbyterians who were increasingly disaffected by the realignments within Ulster Protestantism. Um, so as I say, it also sent out experience a split, um, which, he established, which resulted in the establishment of Mitchell's Remonstrant Synod. Um, and it appears to have been a deeply fr a, a fractious time. So Mitchell himself, John Mitchell Sr., um, in his introduction to his book um, of sermons, um, refers to, quote, that controversial spirit, which has unhappily become so prevalent in his own congregation. He states that the reason for the publication of the sermons is, quote, chiefly to defeat the designs of those who have discovered such a readiness to misrepresent them. So he's clearly trying to fight back against people who are, um, according to him at least, um, misrepresenting what he's actually saying in the pulpit, right? So an address purporting to be from his congregation is also published in this, um, in this book and is signed by the session clerk, uh, Isaac William Glenning, and it follows Mitchell's own introduction and it says that, um, quote, designing persons here, here and elsewhere have been busily employed in misrepresenting your principles and endeavouring to, to excite disaffection to your ministry. So they're seeing a, a, like, um, uh, a disagreement within the congregation, but also seeing it as being part of a wider, um, a wider argument going on within also Presbyterianism at this time. And Mitchell is praised by Glenny um, for his, quote, determination in refusing to be called by any human denomination in religion and in grounding your views of Christian doctrine exclusively on Christian scriptures, unshackled by creeds or confessions drawn up in the words of fallible men. So here's a clear reference to this idea of being bound by, by a confession which is not um, explicitly um, in the Bible. So, um, although the majority of the uh, Presbyterians in Ulster do stay with the Synod um, after the split um, of 1830, Mitchell appears to have carried the majority of, of, of his congregation with him um, through the second non-subscription controversy. Um, although in March 1828, a portion of his congregation, um, disapproving of his views, actually requested the, pres the presbytery of the Moor that they be erected into a new congregation, right? So, Mitchell's, um, although Mitchell takes the majority of his, of his congregation with him, um, a significant minority leave. And the only numbers that we have for that are from um, 1834, in which it appears that there are 1,815 remonstrant members in Newry, um, as opposed to 1,250 in the new congregation. So you can see a very, very uh, big split um, around this time. So these highly charged debates uh, of the late 1820s, um, I think we can, we can surmise, must have had a, um, quite a serious influence on John Mitchell. Um, not least because in, um, at, a, at a later time, um, in 1834, Mitchell himself took an examination uh, with the press of Obama to see if he, in fact, would become a minister like his father. Um, he decided, however, that he did not want to follow that path. But nevertheless, we can be sure that he was, if he was in that position, that he was um, steeped in the rhetoric and uh, the, the theological arguments and the modes of argumentation that would have existed um, in, in Ulster in the, in the, 18, in the 1820s. Um, and also, of course, I suppose the wider, um, the wider context um, is looking, is around this time you see the, um, 
the movement toward Catholic emancipation and the Catholic Association of Daniel O'Connell um, throughout, throughout the, the 1820s. Um, and then when Mitchell um, decides to eventually in a career in law, um, he, he, in Newry, defends, gets a reputation, in fact, for defending local Catholics who've been accused of outrages, and eventually sort of becomes closer and closer to the, to, to the, to, to the policy of repeal, um, and eventually joins the Repeal Association, um, and then moves to Dublin after the death of Thomas Davis in 1845, um, he takes on, he becomes a major writer for the Nation newspaper and takes on some editorial duties as well. Um, Mitchell, however, his views become more radicalised throughout the course of the famine. Um, eventually splits which, uh, with Gavin Duffy, um, who's the owner of the Nation newspaper, and sets up his own newspaper, The United Irishman, in 1848. Well, 1848. And um, so then you see this sort of this progression from this quite um, moderate politics and then you see sort of the real, um, and even his book published in 1845, which is the life of the O'Neill, um, you don't really see the, um, the virulence which characterises his later work from the nation and then into the jail journal, which we look at afterwards. Um, so, um, so moving from Mitchell's own family involvement and his own personal um, uh, background to the wider religious context, um, um, sorry, I missed the, the wrong thing. So this is the scripture doctrine. This is the uh, John Mitchell's um, John Mitchell's book published in 1828 in Newry, as you can see. Um, so then moving on now. So moving on to the sort of the wider the wider um, area of Presbyterian thought at this time. Um, it brings us to the question of millennial and apocalyptic thought in particular. Now these themes um, are, are very evident in Mitchell's own writing, especially in the descriptions of the famine, but also in the ways in which um, uh, he rhetorically produced, the rhetoric of his arguments are very much steeped in this, in this biblical language. Um, and Crawford Gribben has noted um, that the retreat from the millennial to the apocalyptic signals a trend that can be traced throughout the history of Irish Protest Protestantism. And we can certainly see this within, at work in the thought um, of John Mitchell in the Jail Journal in particular. And it's this shift which is fundamental in the construction of John Mitchell's thinking, a moment which would have an, an enormous influence in subsequent articulations of radical forms of Irish nationalism. Um, the relationship between the millennium and the apocalypse, however, is quite a complex one. And it has been subject to quite a lot of debate in theological and other circles. So the idea of the millennium, this, the, the, the idea of this thousand years, um, is from this uh, verse from the book of Revelation, which states, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there's been a lot of um, argumentation over the, over the precise meaning of, of this passage and what those, what those a thousand years in fact refer to. Um, but I think the important point for us here is to note, rather than get bogged down in these arguments, is the malleability of these concepts to the conditions of the age in which they were applied, and the contemporaneous diversity of views that could be justified by them. Thus, the French Revolution, for example, it could be seen as either a harbinger of the millennium, um, or as a fulfilment of the prophecies of, of Revelation. It could be seen as the apocalypse, or it could be seen as the beginning of, of the reign, um, the peaceful reign of a thousand years. And Grebner has pointed out that <clears throat> Uh, Irish Protestant responses to the American and European revolutions demonstrated the malleability of millennial ideas, which could be used as much as a vehicle for reaction as revolution. Now, it is this very malleability that induces us to see in Mitchell's writing a deeply nuanced account of what form the, the apocalypse takes and the role that it plays. That considerations of this sort are central to Mitchell's thinking can be seen in the recurrent allusions to, to, to biblical prophecy and apocalypticism throughout the Jail Journal. Jeremiah and Revelations are repeatedly invoked to lament the state into which things have fallen, right? So Mitchell, even though um, he's highly isolated, is constantly quoting um, from the Bible, he's quoting from Jeremiah, Revelations, Ecclesiastes, and the, the jail journal is littered with these, um, with these references or direct quotes. So by reading Mitchell within his Presbyterian frame, it becomes clear how he draws on the theological and political resources of Presbyterian discourses, not only for his rhetoric, but also to, re to revive redemptive notions of emancipation. So Myrtle Hill has pointed out 
that the utopian vision of sections of Presbyterianism in particular drew on the language and imagery of the books of Daniel and Revelation for intellectual justification, popular appeal, and the optimistic conviction of imminent victory. With Mitchell, however, the idea of promised emancipation is tempered by an articulation of receiving that which one deserves. This idea of desert. Now, this articulation of desert involves a moral judgment on a certain form of action or omission or the failure to act um, that leads to a necessary result, and that result, uh, and that result itself is, is essentially moral exaltation or turpitude. So it is not so much the outcome of the action that is at stake, so it's quite an anti-utilitarian uh, approach, although, although that is certainly bound up in what one deserves, but it is the moral requirement that is most important. So this um, can be seen in Mitchell's famous dialogue with his doppel doppelganger. So for those of you who haven't read the jail journal, uh, Mitchell, in his isolation and loneliness, um, establishes this so-called doppelganger, this double goer, um, to, uh, to which he can have a conversation. So he establishes this uh, inner dialogue and manifests itself through the, the ego and the doppelganger. So in, in, in this dialogue, um, in which he even provingly quotes Jeremiah's assertion that they that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger, for these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. So under this aspect, the destruction of Jerusalem is seen as deserving punishment for the failure of the chosen people to follow God's will. The parallel with Ireland is made explicit in the following passage, in which Mitchell excoriates the Irish people, and O'Connell in particular, O'Connell who, who inspired him um, at one point to, um, um, to get involved with the repeal movement. And he criticises O'Connell for the insistence on so-called moral force. And this is O'Connell's idea that um, no, no political progress is worth the shedding of one drop of blood. Right, this this uh, essentially pacifistic, pacifistic doctrine. But this for Mitchell represents a failure to adhere to the principle of nationality. And therefore famine becomes the just punishment. So Mitchell says, because the Irish have been taught peaceful agitation in their slavery, Therefore, they have been swept by a plague of hunger worse than many years of bloody fighting. Because they would not fight, they have been made to rot off the face of the earth, that so they might know at last how deadly is then his patience and perseverance <clears throat> under a stranger's yoke. Right? So Mitchell is here, although he does, and he's known for blaming the English for the famine, he's also, in a sense, blaming the Irish for the famine um, because of their failure to take the freedom which they could in his opinion, um, if they organised long republican principles and were willing to sacrifice blood even for that cause. So the emphasis here on therefore and the because at the beginning of the second sentence clearly shows that Mitchell is attempting to establish a causal relationship between, between political slavery and famine. So he's saying essentially that famine is a result of the Irish people's political slavery. Um, in the context of the analogy with the destruction of Jerusalem, the national principle which has been betrayed by an insistence on moral force, takes on a quasi-divine aspect. So by employing the biblical rhetoric common in Presbyterian discourses of emancipation, Mitchell seeks popular appeal and intellectual justification, but he subverts the revolutionary optimism through the discourse of desert, right? He said it's not all going to be fine and, and the world and world history does not constitute it by this eternal march of progress, um, but rather people get what they deserve. So in this way, Mitchell can be, t can be said to be taking the argument of the Presbyterian United Irishman, William Steele Dixon, that those who dare to be free through the act of daring um, deserve freedom, to his logical conclusion. Because the Irish do not dare to be free, they do not deserve freedom. And the corollary of that failure is the mass death of the famine. So although Mitchell would certainly find issue with some of the progressive strands of thinking present in the discourse of the United Irishmen, he still draws on a certain Presbyterian articulation of the relationship between desert, what one deserves, and punishment in the national context. This is not to say, however, that Mitchell renounces all hope of Irish freedom. On the contrary, he insists, I swear to you there are blood and brain in Ireland yet, as the world one day shall know. God, let me live to see it. So this apparent expression of hope which ends with the plea to the divine, is immediate, immediately followed by an, by an imagining of the biblical apocalypse onto which the figure of Ireland is, is inscribed, right? So this is Mitchell using language, um, biblical language, which is used to describe the apocalypse and referring directly to Ireland in this great battle. So, quote, On that great day of the Lord, when the kindreds and tongues and nations of the old earth shall give their banners to the wind, 
Let this poor carcass have but breath and strength enough to stand under Ireland's immortal green. The doppelganger replies, Do you allude to the Battle of Armageddon? I know you have been reading the Old Testament of late. And Mitchell emphatically says, Yes. So thus Irish freedom becomes enmeshed in the apocalyptic moment. Right? So the um, and the apocalypse is described in Revelation 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 14, as the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And obvious uh, uh, and Mitchell's obviously making a reference to that here. And that is the moment and the means through which Ireland achieves her freedom. So this reinforces the identification of righteousness in Ireland through recourse to divine imagery, but also places the millennium after the apocalypse. It is only after the ravages of Revelation have been completed that it is possible to achieve the desired national independence. So this leads Mitchell to effectively propound a doctrine that insists on thoroughgoing, even indefinite suffering for the sake of the nation. So this idea of national sacrifice and the nation sacrificing itself for liberty, which is actually rooted in, in ideas of civic republicanism, um, which were also current at the time, and sacrifice for the nation, to so that heroic moment where, where one is willing to sacrifice one's life for, for the life of the nation, um, are totally entwined here. And Mitchell here effectively preempts later, later discourses of blood sacrifice that have been the object of so much debate. But for Mitchell, I think things will always get worse. So there's a distinct ambiguity here between the immortal grain um, of Ireland and the deserved punishment caused by the failure to live up to the promise of nationality. On the one hand, Mitchell is, is taking part in, the, in, the, in this idea that, that the famine is, is a national punishment for the, errant, for, the, for the errant ways of the Irish people. Um, such a discourse can be seen, for example, in the work, work of Hayes MacNeil, um, who used the famine a rod of God, its provoking cause, its merciful design, um, and Adam Peter's work as well, looking at providentialism in, um, in public discourse in the late 1840s. Um, but for Mitchell, the errancy of Ireland did not consist of the toleration um, of Roman Catholicism or the grant for the Roman Catholic University at Maynooth, as, a, as some believed, but rather in Ireland's failure to dare to be free. On the other hand, the famine itself is, con is construed as part of the apocalyptic moment through which Ireland might obtain freedom. So we see here an 1847 poem from Jane Elgie, uh, later to be Jane Wilde, who was known as Speranza, who was writing for the Nation newspaper. Uh, and she, in she also invoked this apocalyptic imagery in her poem, The Stricken Land. And the title itself is an echo of the passage from Lamentations that we quoted earlier. Um, and this is first published in The Nation. So it goes, Now is your hour of pleasure, bask ye in the world's caress, but our whitening bones against ye will rise as witnesses. From the cabins and the ditches in their charred uncoffined masses, for the angel of the trumpet will know them as he passes, a ghastly spectral army before the great God will stand, and arraign ye as our murderers, the spoilers of, of our land. So it is not precisely, uh, it's not simply in spite of the affliction of famine that Irish independence might begin, but it, it is precisely the famine reconstituted as a moment of national apocalypse through which the millennial promise of nationality can be realized. It, um, in this subversive appropriation of the doctrine of desert, uh, Mitchell manages to impose on his own post-millennial, he, he manages to impose his own post-millennial interpretation of the, of the apocalypse. <clears throat> so this millennium, um, of peace and freedom will occur after the, after the apocalypse and increasingly for Mitchell the famine itself represents this moment of apocalypse. So he poses the, the famine on the one hand as punishment but also as the means for redemption. So central to this, to this construction of the famine as apocalypse is the idea of vengeance. So as Jean Elgie's poem highlights, the apocalyptic moment is one of arraignment in which the transgressors will be called to account for their crimes by the victims of those crimes, with the charred and coffined masses acting as witnesses. Similarly, in an echo of the public nature of arraignment, Mitchell states that he, he desires, quote, public vengeance, public justice. However, the difficulty for Mitchell can be traced to the theological problem um, of the eternal judgment of nations, as opposed to that of individuals. For if nations were, not, were supposed not to have an afterlife, not being possessed of an individual soul, then the punishment for nations must be expected in the present. So for, e for, so for, evangelicals, uh, for, so for evangelical contemporaries of Mitchell, um, Chris Marash has pointed out, national sins, we may accordingly expect, will be, will be punished in this present world by its righteous governor. Thus nations may be punished for the ill behaviour of their members 
and the members themselves will be punished eternally in the afterlife. Mitchell's engagement with this discourse heralds a more deeply secular reading of the Apocalypse, with the nation as a divine surrogate. This can be seen in a quotation he uses in the jail journal, which states, um, quote, nations are chastised for the crimes in this world. They have no future state. Um, and I have managed to locate the source of this quote, and if anybody can help me with that, it would be much appreciated. Nations are chastised for the crimes in this world. They have no future state. And the provenance of this statement is unclear, although it clearly relates to discourse employed by evangelical Christians of the 1840s. So John Mitchell is here accepting um, the temporality of the nation, but at the same time elevating the nation conceptually to a level of actor in the final battle of Armageddon. Right? So Mitchell, so this, this idea of apocalypse and Armageddon, Mitchell really sees a role for the nation in that. He sees Ireland in that, represented in the previous quote by the immortal green. So by doing this, we can discern an appropriation of Christian discursive tropes, but one which engages in a simultaneous subversion of those same tropes. The result of this is a rhetoric of an, of an effectively apotheosized nation. So the nation becomes almost a godlike figure um, that supplants the divine as a central category of the apocalypse. So for Mitchell, the, all the ingredients of the apocalypse are there, but it's the nation rather than God acting in it. Um, so this further entails an imputed secularization of both the apocalypse and the ethical sphere in, zen, in general. This is not to say that Mitchell is necessarily rejecting Christianity as such, but rather he's employing his language and themes to the end of espousing his, old, his own radical political philosophy through the tradition of scripture politics. So the level of remove from orthodox incorporation, uh, incorporation of Christian theology into his thought can, can be seen in the jail journal in a passage which calls for public vengeance. So in it he states, um, never object that so the innocent children would be, would be scourged for what their guilty fathers did. It is so forever. A profligate father may go on sinning prosperously all his days with a high hand and heart and die in triumphant iniquity. But as children are born to disease, poverty, misery of mind, body and estate, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Mysterious are the works and ways of God. This is clear, clear biblical allusions here. But if we actually look at the, at the quote that, uh, that, that Mitchell is deploying here um, from Jeremiah 31, 29, um, the biblical text actually reads, in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. And similarly in Ezekiel 18, um, chapter 18, verses two to three, what mean ye that, that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye, sh ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Right? Um, thus Mitchell is here taking an, outlong, uh, an outlawed Israelite saying and reincorporating, uh, reincorporating it into his narrative. It is the same pattern of appropriation and subversion of the biblical themes through his use of biblical language and rhetoric. This subversion can be seen to highlight the extent to which Mitchell, in spite of and through his use of prophetic discourses, fundamentally reconfigures the way in which this Presbyterian tradition can be articulated. This passage is also particularly useful for outlining the new content that Mitchell is creating through his engagement with this tradition. So for the, because here the punishment for iniquity is, a stink, is distinctly temporal in nature, it's of this world. So the afflictions emerging from, from industrial capitalism here are precisely those that affect the children of profligate fathers, misery, poverty and disease. So in a sense, although these, these biblical themes with biblical language, the critique that Mitchell is actually engaging on is essentially a materialist one, right? He's talking about very real life, concrete, worldly situations and using these, this highly biblical uh, language to describe it. Um, so he's not rejecting Christian belief as such, um, but he does hint that he's sympathetic towards non-Christian forms of belief um, in a few occasions in the jail journal. His insistence, however, on God as the ruler of the world is made repeatedly clear, um, but it is done in the context of three raids against capital of, um, or in order to excoriate England. So in particular, the, um, the markets um, or, or the, the, the stock markets and the stock exchange is a key, um, is a, is a key um, object of criticism for Mitchell as, an industri as is industrial capitalism in general. So Mitchell says, um, by terrible signs and wonders, it shall be made known that comfort is not the chief end of man. I do affirm, I, 
that capital is not the ruler of the world, that the Almighty has no pecuniary interest in the stability of the funds or the European balance of power. Finally, that no engineering, civil or military, can raise man above the heavens or shake the throne of God. So I think here we have a classic Mitchell-like formulation with the, with the quasi-evangelical witness, the I, um, I do affirm I, um, invoking the terrible signs and wonders. And these terrible signs and wonders are used in the Bible as a signifier of God's wrath and intervention into the affairs of men. Um, and then this is followed by this pathetic claim to God's indifference to finance. So this comic pathos is echoed in an earlier passage in which he states, um, Indeed, it is faithfully believed in the, in the city by the money circles there that God the Father has money invested in the three percents, which makes him careful not to disturb the peace of the world or suffer the blessed march of civilization to be stopped. So importantly, the invocation of God as an actor on the world stage functions as a plea for a plea of righteousness against what Mitchell, after Cobbett, um, perhaps calls the devouring thing, which is capital. But at the same time, by deploying God the Father in such a way, the divine becomes merely figurative, a device with which to chastise the English financiers and capitalists. The opposition between God and capital becomes a formal one, in that on the one hand we have a really existing city of London, which is with, with its financiers, its factories, etc., while on the other hand, God functions as a method of criticism of that really existing reality. So again, this deployment of God and, these, and this religious rhetoric functions as what I, said, what, what, what I said previously was essentially a materialist critique. So the content of that criticism from Mitchell takes on a profoundly national character. So when he takes Francis Bacon and Thomas Babington Macaulay to task for exemplifying the philosophy um, of what, he calls, what Mitchell calls the spirit of the age, Mitchell predicts that it foreshadows national death. So there is, quote, a radical confounding of the English national intellect and language, a chronic addlement of the general brain, and it is, and it is indeed more alarming than the gibbering of Babel. Right? So the, the reference to Babel, of course, implies the imminent demise of England through divine intervention um, as a result of national hubris. And in an echo of Ecclesiastes, um, in an echo of Ecclesiastes, Mitchell goes on to say, let a nation act with all the energy of its national life. Do with its might what its hand find it to do. To truth it has got to utter, speak it, speak it in thunder. So this is particularly illuminating if one considers the original quote. Whatsoever thy hand find it to do, do it with, with thy might. For there is no work, or nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So here, mortality is construed as the basis for acting in a certain way in this life without thought of punishment in the afterlife. And it seems to correspond with the notion which we discussed earlier that the nation lives only on earth. However, the voice of the nation is characterized by thunder. And thunder, in biblical terms, is conceived um, as the voice of God. So by insisting on the mortality of the nation and the insistence that it act accordingly, while giving it the voice of God, reconfigures the opposition between modernity and the divine through the interposition of the nation. The nation then becomes the foundational concept that both pre-exists and outlasts the fitting constructions of the present and exists in opposition to, quote, the British policy that must drain the blood and suck the marrow of all the nations it can fasten its, its desperate claws upon. What is clear is that the nation has both an essential moral force and one that demands earthly realisation. So, vengeance. So, drawing on this, uh, this um, the importance of desert and vengeance, the relationship between the nation and righteousness is fairly, uh, further illustrated by the following, following quotation. Punishment for England, then, for the crimes of England. This righteous public vengeance I seek and shall seek. Let but justice be done, that Ireland's wrong be righted, and the wrong done to me, and mine is more than avenged. For the whole is greater than its part, now mine hair, he's referring to his doppelganger here, um, you have my theory of vengeance, and for such vengeance I do th vehemently thirst and burn. Thus vengeance is interposed as a central feature in Mitchell's understanding of the famine as an event participating in, in a providential world history. And so there we've gone through the sort of the major, sort of what I see the major sort of biblical themes that Mitchell appropriates and deploys throughout his jail journal.
what, but what I want to do now is to, is to consider the ways in which missions can be understood with regard to the development of nationalism in general um, in the 19th century and sort of try to perhaps take Mitchell out as this very particular and very um, a unique Irish frame and see how we can understand it from a more theoretical perspective. Um, so this end is sort of taking a few sort of key theorists, a few, few quotes that somehow seems to fit or not fit with Mitchell. And as I say, this is still work, work in progress. I'm really trying to develop the ways in which Mitchell really does or does not fit in to these, um, to these different th- uh, theoretical approaches towards the development of nationalism. Um, and Hobsbawm, um, it is now classic work nations and nationalism since 1780, um, s- talks about religion um, as being an ancient and well-tried method of establishing communion through common practice and a sort of brotherhood between people who otherwise have nothing in common. Right? Um, but he also says um, that the link between religion and nationalism can be very close as the examples between Poland and Ireland demonstrate. Um, and to, to make the point even more clear, he says, in Europe, only the nationalist Irish who have no neighbours other than Protestants are exclusively defined by their religion, which is a wild generalisation. I think you probably agree um, from Hobsbawm there. Um, however, I think this is, the, I think this is the, the major way, especially in the literature on nationalism, the, way, the major way in which... Um, Religion is seen in nationalist, nationalist uh, discourses. Um, and Anthony D. Smith um, also says, only by paying attention to these religious myths, symbols, and traditions can we hope to understand which nations emerged and where, and why it was the nation that triumphed as the, social, the norm of social and political organization. And, but I think that Mitchell really helps us to complexify this idea. And going back to Hobsbawm's definition is that the, this idea, so, so Hobbes is obviously saying that Irish nationalism is essentially a Catholic, is a Catholic um, thing, whereas I think what we've seen, well especially through Mitchell and seen Mitchell's influence on people like Pierce and, uh, and others and, and Griffith and um, that Mitchell's, Mitchell's language is in fact not from, it's, it's not from this um, common communion um, it's not from the, the it's not from the community which is in, endorsed an, a, 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 an an Irish nationalism, but I think what Mitchell perhaps shows us, I think this needs to be demonstrated further, but it's only a tentative conclusion at the minute, is that there's a more perhaps more of a commonality of discourse running through Ireland in the 1830s and 1820s and 1840s than perhaps we realise, and it actually crosses over confessional boundaries in deeper ways, and that people that a language. For Mitchell's rhetoric to be persuasive, as it, as it undoubtedly was, and uh, went through um, scores of reprints uh, over the next um, decades, and um, the Jail Journal in particular, it would need to have been understood in a certain way by those reading it. And undoubtedly, many of those reading it did come from the Catholic community and were Catholic nationalists in, 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 in to a greater or lesser extent. But it must have had resonance. And where does that resonance come from? And I think that's a sort of a, a key a key way of understanding Mitchell. And Mitchell's helps us to understand that. Religion might actually, in fact, act beyond, um, act beyond those who practice it, and that it suffuses the sort of the the the, the discourse of a given society. Um, but those are, as I say, tentative conclusions. Um, but moving on, I think another way um, is Eli Kadiri, um, whose work I've always been pretty skeptical of, and there's been a lot of criticism of Kadiri, not least for his highly psychological psychologistic approaches um, to the study of nationalism, but also for his um, quite normative dismissal um, of it and, and sort of there's a reductionism I think going on there. But looking at um, but what's quite interesting in terms of looking at nationalism as a form of political religion, which became a very sort of popular way of looking at nationalism in the in the nineteen sixties, precisely in those post colonial, those newly independent states um, in Africa and Asia in particular, um, this idea of saying um, Seeing nationalism as a uh, substituting the nation for the for the deity, and um, the citizen body for the church, and the political kingdom for the kingdom of God, um, which I do think we can see resonances of Mitchell in that in this secularisation um, process, and Kaduri, and Kaduri sees nationalism as the product of what he describes as marginal men, 
Um, and in his analysis of nationalism in Asia and Africa, he sees the imperial political system um, as resultant in an intellectual wastage that in turn feed, uh, feeds into discontent. So essentially, the sort of the imperial uh, the imperial regime um, blocks the sort of ambitious and, and capable young young men in particular from the sort of from the access to to powers and positions that they think um, are perhaps are perhaps their right. But again, I'm not sure that Mitchell necessarily fits into this pattern either. Um, in that, to some extent, he's actually from quite a privileged position. Um, but it's, in a sense, it's only his identification with the nation itself, with the nation of Ireland, that actually puts him into a marginal position. Um, so the second point that Kuduri makes is that the, um, the difficulty of the colonised subject um, to be assimilated into sort of the ideological and social apparatus of empire, and Kiduri here is talking about India, Kenya, etc., um, leads to a turning away from the hope of amelioration or reform from um, from the uh, from the imperial uh, rulers to a complete opposition to foreign rule and a complete immersion into this idea of the nation. And I do think that Mitchell himself does overly identify with the nation. I mean, in some ways, and in, in, in some ways, his analysis in the Jail Journal, in particular, in which the preface is composed essentially of a history of Ireland, in which he says, "My story is essentially just the next chapter of this." Um, so there is this, this heightened identification of um, of his individuality with the nation, um, which would be consistent with what Kaduri says. And finally, this leads to, according to Kaduri, an actual or rhetorical violence due to nationalism's quote, transvaluation of values that it needs to undertake in order to be effective. So one of Kaduri's big arguments is that for nationalism to really take hold, both in Europe in the, in the 1840s and in the late 19th and 20th centuries um, elsewhere in the world, it needs to subject the sort of ruling ideology, if you like, to a complete and total critique, um, this transvaluation of values, which Kaduri borrows from, from Nietzsche, which applies a thorough critique of all existing ideological and social institutions. I think in some way Mitchell does definitely partake in this, especially with his um, acerbic and critical commentary on, um, on um, industrial capitalism in particular. Um, and as Anthony Smith has pointed out the folk of Yuri, um, nationalist mobilisation and manipulation of the masses can only succeed if history and religion are taken seriously and their emotions politicised and harnessed to the national cause. The elites have no option. They are constrained by pre-existing mass cultures and especially religions. Um, so we take away the, the, perhaps the denominative dimension of this idea that the masses are manipulated by elites. Um, I think there's still something interesting in this, in that there is a pre-existing discourse into which these nationalist uh, advocates um, are, 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 are intervening in. And I think that for Mitchell, again, going back to the previous point, for Mitchell's rhetoric to be effective, which is so saturated with apocalyptic and um, millennial uh, ideas, that these things need to be already rooted in public discourse, national discourse at the time, to, to be as effective as they arguably were. Um, so, yeah, so nationalists, again, um, from Smith, nationalist intellectuals are important only to the extent that they articulate and help organise fundamental popular sentiments, perceptions and attitudes which derive as much from pre-existing symbols, memories, myths, values and traditions on which the intellectuals draw for the ideologies of the nation as from the needs of the modern moment. So again, I think it's to say, uh, reiterate this point, is that Mitchell, Mitchell's effectiveness um, is both rooted in um, his own, his own uh, rhetoric of apocalypse and millennium, but it's also effective because, to some extent, this already exists within within broader Irish society, including including the Catholic population. So I think I'm just going to leave it at that, and happy to take any questions or suggestions or tell me I'm wrong or whatever. So thank you.